actually a client of Doug's and invited Ronald to uh, our Thursday group meeting at, uh, of all places, Rib Crib. And so Ronald has come several times and Ronald, it's great to have you here this morning and brought your two children with us and I assure you they're going to receive good training and teaching up there in our children's ministry, but we're glad to have you, Ronald, this morning. Well, it's just great to see you and, and uh, be a part of, of this time this morning, be able to share with you the word of the Lord this morning. I want you to turn in your Bibles, either on your phone or at, yes? Oh yeah, Greg Small, you're Greg Small's son. Yeah, we, you've been here before. Thank you, Ryan, for coming again. We're, we're glad to have you. This, is, is Greg doing okay? Okay, all right. He got to retire this year, huh? Wow, that's one of my classmates. All my classmates are retiring, so here I am. All right. We're in Luke chapter 1 this morning. I mean, Matthew chapter 1. I'm sorry, we were in Luke last week. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. And I'm just going to summarize the first 17 verses uh, for you. In the, in the first 17 verses, we have the genealogy of Jesus. Now, I know some of you may think, well, that is, that is really boring. Genealogies. You know, the Bible is a book of miracles. It's a book of recorded miracles from Genesis to Revelation. And do you understand that one of the recorded miracles in the Bible is genealogy? Let me ask you a question. In this particular genealogy, it traces the genealogy of Jesus for 42 generations. How many of you know your genealogy going back? 42 generations. Raise your hand. You know, when people do family trees today in America, we just like to get back to, can we find out where they came from in Europe? You know, if we get back to that, it's like, oh, I'm satisfied now. I know where I came from. It's an absolute miracle that God preserved the genealogy of Jesus. And that there's 42 generations in this particular genealogy. There's bigger ones. There's bigger ones in the Bible. From Abraham to Jesus. To me, that's absolutely incredible. Now, <clears throat> there's some incredible names in this genealogy. and uh, Can you see it? Yeah, you can see it pretty well up here. But look at some of the names that were in the genealogy of Jesus. The family tree of Jesus. In other words, here's Jesus, and then here's all of his grandfathers. Clear back to Abraham. All right? Look at some of the names that are in this particular genealogy. Of course, you have Abraham. All right? But then you also have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's important to recognize that you have, from Jacob, there were 12 sons, and one of the sons was named Judah, because Jesus was going to be from the tribe of Judah. He is called the Lion of Judah. All right? And then, not only do you have Judah in this family tree, but you have Boaz. Remember the story of Boaz and Ruth? And then you have, obviously, Jesse, who is the father of the second king of Israel, King David. And you remember that a promise was made to David about his descendants and their position in Israel as the ruling family. There was a promise made to David that that would be the case. All right? So you have David in this genealogy. And then you have Solomon, obviously, the son of David. And then Jehoshaphat. And then you have uh, Jotham, Hezekiah, Josiah, Zerubbabel. And then Joseph's father, Jacob. These are just a few of what I would call the stars of Israel. And they're, they're in the genealogy of Jesus. They're in the family tree of, of Jesus. And this genealogy was given by Matthew in Matthew 1, 1 through 17 because he wanted to show that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. And one of the ways that he showed it was by giving this incredible genealogy. It's just amazing to me 
that as much work as people do today on Ancestry.com to try to find out their family tree, that God himself preserved this. Nobody had to do any work. He preserved it. That is an absolute miracle. In fact, show me another person where this could be said. Give me one in all of human history. Can you, can you come up with one? Where they know 42 generations in their family tree? Come on now. Those of you that are unbelievers, tell me one. You know, there, you won't be able to find one in human history. This is a miracle of God, the preservation of the family history. And then that brings us to Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. And I'm going to tell it to you as best I can. And you can follow along in the text, if you would like, on your phone or in your Bible in order to fact check me. Okay? And those facts are very important. And I may miss some. And uh, be sure and check me on the facts. So here's, here's the birth of Jesus according to Matthew. Matthew says that a man named Joseph who lived in Nazareth. And remember where Nazareth was? Uh, it is, and let me figure this out, right here. It's right up here, right? It says Galilee up here. And remember the prophecy? Where would the Messiah come from for the Jews? He would come from the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, by the way of the sea, north of the Jordan River, Galilee of the Gentiles, all right? And so this is where Joseph is, is from. And Joseph is betrothed, which for you younger folks or those of you that are new to the Bible, it, it, it was the Jewish engagement. It was much more serious than the engagements that we go through in America. I mean, once you entered into an agreement to marry, you were considered committed from that point forward. And it took a divorce in order to end the engagement, a public divorce. There wasn't any of this, you know, where the woman just walks in and gives you the ring. I'm ending this today. No, it was a very public uh, matter when an engagement uh, was broken. And they called it being betrothed or betrothal. And so Joseph uh, was betrothed or betrothed to a woman named Mary. And she was a young woman, and we told her story last week. And he got the word that she was with child. And I want to share with you an opinion that I have because of the context. I believe that he received the word that she was with child and the report that was given him was that she was with child by the Holy Spirit. Now Joseph didn't have any, any way to confirm that. Right? Here you are, you're engaged to be married. And all of a sudden the woman you're engaged to be married to is found to be with child. And she gives you a report. Or someone else gives you a report that she received that she is with child and the child is by the Holy Spirit. What are you going to think? You know, <laughs> that would be very difficult to believe. And so, yeah, you would think she wasn't telling the truth or at least you would have some serious doubts. And he didn't have any way to confirm this. But Joseph was a just man. What that means is when someone is a just man is that they want to do what is morally right all the time. Doesn't mean they always do what is morally right all the time. No one does. There is, there is none, none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But in his heart, he wanted to do what was morally right all of the time. And what was morally right, according to what, Mos uh, what uh, Joseph thought, was what Moses said in the law of God in the Old Testament. And so he wanted to do what was morally right. Also, to be just means to be innocent. Joseph wanted to be innocent. He didn't want to make a bad decision. He didn't want to make a wrong decision that was wrong morally. 
He wanted to be innocent. Well, he didn't have any confirmation that this story that he heard about her being uh, with child by the Holy Spirit was actually the truth. But he went to sleep and he had a dream. And in his dream, the angel of the Lord came to him and spoke to him. And the angel of the Lord said to Joseph, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child that she is carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you will name him Jesus. And this fulfilled a prophecy from Isaiah, the seventh chapter. And the prophecy was this, the virgin shall be with child and she will bring forth a son and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph woke up from his sleep. He had the confirmation that he needed. What he had heard, he believed was true. And he decided to take Mary as his wife. To do what the angel in the dream told him to do. But he kept her a virgin until after the child was born. And then when the child was born, he named him Jesus. You know, when I look at this particular story, I try to put myself in Joseph's shoes. And how I can identify with him is that there's been many times in my life where I've gotten a report that was very disturbing and unsettling. There's been many times in my life, and I'm sure you've experienced it in your life, where I've been very disappointed in someone because of a report that I had received about them. And when that person that I received the report about was someone that was close to me, that was someone that I, I really cared about, was someone that I was really counting on, I was devastated. I mean, just absolutely devastated. And one of the things that devastated me was I thought I knew that person, and then when I get this report, I'm not so sure that I know them. The person I thought they were it doesn't seem to be that they're really that person, that I'd really been deceived, that I'd really been fooled. And Joseph must have felt that way when he got this report. Now, Joseph would have done what every good Jewish man was supposed to do once they you know, got engaged. He started preparing a place for them to live, and he was a carpenter. As he was preparing a place, all that would do was build his anticipation about marrying Mary. I mean, every, you know, every, every room that he fashioned, every, every part of the construction... He was investing himself for what? He was investing himself for her. It was all about her as he prepared himself. And so his anticipation of being married to her was just growing as the engagement proceeded. I mean, if you want to know, if you really want to know how a Jewish man anticipated being married to his bride read the song of Solomon I mean I have had parents tell me they don't let their children read it because what it reveals is is very graphic about a man and a woman's anticipation of being together in marriage and so here was Joseph living with that kind of anticipation. And all of a sudden, 
he gets this report that she is with child and he knows the child that is not his. He had to be devastated. You know, when I see that kind of devastation, and when I've experienced, I I know this, it's pretty hard to respond correctly. I mean, when someone that you care about, that that you count on, disappoints you, it's pretty difficult to respond correctly. And when I see Joseph's response, I'm absolutely stunned. I'm shocked. I'm amazed. To me, it's an otherworldly response. You don't see this kind of response normally when some fella finds out that his fiance is with child and the child is not his. You don't see this kind of response. Amazing. I asked the question, how in the world could he respond this way? Well, the story reveals some things to us about Joseph that shows us not only how he responded, but but how he did it. First of all, it says that he he was a just man. He was a just man. And and because he was a just man, he knew the law. And he knew what was the right thing to do. And the right thing to do was found in the laws of Moses. And I want to show you that law this morning. It's Deuteronomy 22, 20 and 21. It says, But if the thing is true and evidences of virginity are not found for the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house And the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So you shall put away the evil from among you. That's what he knew from the law was the right thing to do. But he was in a quandary, you see, because he had this report that the child that she was carrying was from the Holy Spirit. And so he was having doubts. What's the right thing to do? He could not conclude with those doubts that this was the right thing to do. And so what he decided to do, because he was a just man, is that he decided to put her away privately. Now, for this to happen right here, if your fiancé was with child and you found out about it and you were the one that was engaged to her, then in order for her to be condemned in stone, you would have to be the chief witness. Because the child could be yours. The people could think the child was yours. And so you would have to be the chief witness. Well, Joseph didn't want to be the chief witness if it was going to be a false accusation. And so he could not do this with the doubts that he had. He was a just man. He wanted to be an innocent man. And so he came up with another plan. With him not really knowing whether or not it was true or not, his plan was, I am going to put her away, and I'm going to do it privately. In other words, I'm not going to be the witness in the trial. I am going to put her away privately. And maybe she could go back and live at her cousin Elizabeth's house or with some other family member, and she would experience the least amount of shame He was a just man. He was committed to do the right thing, but he didn't know what the right thing was. He was a just man. Not only was he a just man, but Joseph, he was a patient man. He slept on it. I want you to know that's not the normal response when you're devastated. Normal response is, what is that person's number? Pick up your phone. Let me tell you what I think of you. You know, that's the normal response. But he was a patient man. He was a man of the word. He knew the word. We're going to talk about that more in just a moment. But for example, I think he knew the word. It's not moving. It's Proverbs chapter 
19, verse 2. It says, also is not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he sins who hastens with his feet. And so he, was, he didn't want to sin by being haste. And so he didn't act right away. He was a patient man. He wanted to get all of the facts before he made a judgment. And so he slept on it. He didn't rush to judgment by making a, a rash decision. And you know what? As a result, this gave God an opportunity to speak to his heart. And God did. Joseph was a patient man. Well, Joseph was not only a patient man, but he was a wise man. You know Psalms 1. I'm sure Joseph knew Psalms 1. I'm sure he knew this proverb that I just shared with you just a moment ago. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Joseph was familiar with this and other passages of Scripture, and he wanted to be a wise man. And that passage of Scripture says, if you want to be a wise man, what you have to do is that instead of walking in the way of the ungodly and standing in the path of sinners and, and sitting in the seat of scoffers, you must delight in the law of the Lord. And so he delighted in the law of the Lord, and it made him wise and part of the scripture that he would have delighted in would have been the prophecies about the messiah the isaiah 9 ruler you know the one that says in isaiah chapter 9 it says for unto us a child is born unto us it says a son is given and the government will rest on his shoulders and he shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god eternal father prince of peace and there will be no end to his government or of peace for on the throne of David and over his kingdom he will establish it and uphold it with righteousness and judgment from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this Joseph knew those prophecies and so when the angel of the Lord came to him and spoke to him he had in his mind prophecies he knew this one, the one in Isaiah 7, 14, where Isaiah said, inspired by the Spirit of the Lord, but a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so because Joseph knew these prophecies, when, when he had this dream, it wasn't like, oh, I had a dream. I better do what I dreamt. No, it was, it was, it confirmed not what Mary said. It confirmed the prophecy of Scripture. And he knew that he was walking in the way of the Lord by choosing to take Mary as his wife because of the prophecy of Scripture. Joseph was a wise man. He was not only a wise man, but he was a courageous man. Just think about it. You know, Psalm 118.6, which I'm sure he knew this one. It says, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? When Joseph made the decision to take Mary as his wife, he risked his life. Oh, he knew the prophecies about this particular ruler. He knew what he was taking on as far as his own personal responsibility for the care of this ruler. He was risking his very life. He, he, could, he could, you know, he was reasonable. He could add up in his mind. This is not going to go over very well with the Roman government. And he was right. 
He was risking his life. But not only his life, he was, he was going ahead and marrying a woman that was already with child. He was risking his reputation among his own people. But he was a courageous guy. He said, no, I, I'm going to do what the Lord says to do. You see, he trusted in God rather than fearing man. And he made the right decision. He was a courageous man. So here's Joseph. Joseph was a, a just man, a patient man, a wise man. He was a courageous man. And he made the right decision. You know, these characteristics in Joseph's life, they were going to be critical moving forward. Because he had some more serious decisions that he had to make with Mary and with this new child that he named Jesus. And it was because he was a just man, a patient man, a wise man, and a courageous man that he could be trusted by God for this mission. And not only was he this way, but Mary was too. It's easy to see why God chose Mary and Joseph for this particular mission. You know, I ask the question, why in the world would they do it? And here's the reason why. God had made himself known to them. They knew God. Now, their revelation of God was limited compared to what you and I have today. But they knew God. And you know what? Because they knew God, they loved God. They loved God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength and that's why they did it they knew God and they loved God because they knew God you know they would know Jesus and they would know God in Jesus <laughs> in human flesh when they in the future but they didn't know God in Jesus when they made these decisions their revelation of God was limited. I mean, Jesus was the fullness of God in human flesh. If you want to know what God is like right now, all you have to do is read about Jesus. That's who he is. But they didn't know that when they made this particular decision. You know, even after Jesus was born and as Jesus began to grow up and they knew him, their knowledge of God was still limited. You see, Joseph actually dies before Jesus begins his public ministry. He's nowhere mentioned as Jesus began his public ministry. And we don't have a text that says that he died, but he's nowhere to be found. And so the assumption based upon context is that he passed away, is that he died. If, he was, if Joseph was around 20 when Jesus was born... Then Joseph died before he was 50 years old. And so his revelation of God through Jesus was pretty limited. You see, only, only Mary was able to see the fullness of God in Jesus. She was there throughout the public ministry of Jesus. She saw everything that Jesus did. And as she saw Jesus, her understanding of her son grew. <laughs> I mean, it kept growing. Just like you and I, we study the scripture, we know a little bit about Jesus. The more we study the life of Jesus, all of a sudden we know more about God. And that's what was going on in Mary's life. Until finally, she stood at the cross, and she was there at the cross. And she saw God in human flesh suffer for her sins and the sins of the world. But even then, it didn't all make sense to her until after Jesus rose from the dead. All of a sudden, for Mary and all of the disciples of Jesus, it began to make complete sense what was going on after Jesus rose from the dead. Here's what she came to understand. God loved her so much that he suffered in her place. That's what she, began, that's what she realized after the resurrection. When Jesus died on the cross, God's judgment against her was fulfilled, done, for her sins. 
The suffering of Jesus for her was sufficient for God to say on the cross, it is finished. She came to understand that after the resurrection. And it all made sense. Let me ask you, does it make sense to you? Does it make sense to you that God created man in, in his own image, in his own likeness, but that man rebelled against God and went his own way? And God's penalty for man's rebellion was, was death. But then the God-man, Jesus Christ, suffered the penalty so that Man doesn't have to experience it. Does it make sense to you? Do you know God? Do you know God through Jesus? Because that's the way you get to know God, is only through Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Because you know him? You know, one of the errors in people's minds that keeps people from receiving Jesus is a total misunderstanding of justice. I mean, it, people's understanding of justice is so far from the truth today, it's incredible. I listen to news programs and they start talking about what's just and what's unjust. And, and most of the time, the people that are talking, they don't have a clue. Where are they getting, where are they getting their ideas about what's, what's just and what's unjust? And so many political decisions are being made in the United States today based upon people's wrong ideas about what's just and what's unjust. And, and, and I hear people that don't know God and don't love Jesus say, how could God send people to hell to suffer eternally? You know what that means to me? It means that you just don't understand justice. You have a false idea of what it means for God to be just and what justice is. Otherwise, if you have a right understanding of justice, you would go, well, I see perfectly how God could do that. Let me talk to you for just a few moments about justice this morning. What would you think if a judge forgave murders, forgave rapists, forgave pedophiles, forgave thieves, and just released them back into society to continue injuring other people? What would you think about that? Well, you would say, especially if you were the victim, you would say, that's not just. That's not right. Well, let me ask you a question. What kind of punishment is just for a murderer? Well, some of you would raise your hand and say, well, I know the answer to that question. It says so in the law of God. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In other words, if someone's taken a life, then the just punishment, just also means equity, would mean that they lose their life. Well, let me ask you a question. And I'll put it in this context. A few years ago, I went to McAllister to witness an execution. A woman in our church was going to the execution because her father had been murdered by this fellow. And then her brother, who was still living, had been permanently disabled. He shot both of them. He killed the father, and then he permanently disabled her brother. And so she was going to the execution at McAllister, and she asked me to go with her. And so I went to the execution. And so, I mean, I've seen lots of people die in the course of my lifetime now. But this, this one was a little different, <laughs> you know, it, it was just, it was hard to be a witness to this injection. Death by injection is what it was. Well, let me ask you a question. 
there were several victims in that particular situation. One of them was the murdered victim. Okay? Is the death of this fellow going to satisfy justice for the murdered victim? Is somehow he going to get his life back? No. Well, well what, about, what about her brother who's permanently disabled the rest of his life? Is that guy dying going to satisfy justice for him? Or is he going to continue to suffer the rest of his life? Even though this guy that killed him, he's not suffering anymore. If he knew Jesus. What about, what about this daughter? She has to live without her father. Even after this guy's executed. It, it, has justice been satisfied for her? Or is she still suffering from what this murderer did? Well, she's still suffering to this day. She's suffering for what this murderer did to her father and to her brother. She is still suffering to this day. That kind of justice, which I believe in, is just social justice. And it's, and it's, it's needed. <laughs> we need social justice. Because social justice preserves order in society. You know what that means? It means that that fellow that died is not going to be murdering any more people in prison or outside of prison. You know, a lot of murderers that get life in prison, they end up murdering somebody else. You know that, right? And so, yeah, I'm glad for social justice. But social justice is not personal justice. Justice wasn't satisfied because this fellow was executed. No. This, this lady continues to suffer to this day, and so does that son, because of what this fellow did. Personal justice, you need to understand it. For, for, for a punishment to be just, the person that sins should at least suffer until those that were injured stop suffering. Now that's justice. You suffer as long as I suffer. Now you hear that cry for personal justice all the time by those victims that are living when they go to parole hearings. What do they say? If they're at the parole hearing of someone who murdered someone close to them, what do they say? They say to the parole board, it's not right for him to be let out because we're still suffering. What they're appealing for is personal justice, not social justice. Personal justice. And you know what? They're right. It's not wrong for that fellow to stop suffering as long as we're suffering. That is justice. What about false accusations? This last week and last two weeks in the news, a football player at the University of Oklahoma was accused of rape by a woman. The district attorney and and that county did their investigation, and they could not find enough facts to charge this football player. Now, who's lying in this? I don't know. But I do know this. If he's guilty, she's going to suffer the rest of her life because of what he did. She's not going to experience personal justice. Let me say this to you. Even if she got a gun and went and shot him, it wouldn't end her suffering. Personal justice wouldn't be satisfied. On the other hand, if she's lying, this guy is going to suffer from that false accusation for the rest of his life. So here's the point. One of them's guilty. One of them needs to suffer for the rest of their life because the other one's going to suffer. For the rest of their life. Do you think apologizing is going to stop the suffering? I mean how. If a man is unfaithful to his wife. And he goes to her and says. You know I'm really sorry for what I did. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Does that stop her suffering? No. <laughs> that doesn't stop her suffering. 
Should she forgive him? Sure. But it doesn't stop her from suffering for the rest of her life. Anytime that thought comes across her mind that the man who pledged herself to faithfulness to her in marriage violated that pledge. It causes her to suffer for the rest of her life. Now, if you understand personal justice, it ought to humble you. Because that means if you've been wrong, you can't make amends. You can't stop the other person's suffering. Now, look, if you stole something from me and, uh, and it was something that was replaceable and it got replaced, I'd stop suffering. Right? But what if it was irreplaceable? What if it was something meaningful to me and it was lost because you stole it and I can't get it back? It wouldn't matter if you went to prison. It wouldn't matter if you paid me five times what it was worth. You might fulfill social justice, but you're going to cause me to suffer for the rest of my life every time I miss that thing, whatever it was. So what is a just punishment for sin? See, a just punishment, get this, a just punishment is when a guilty person suffers as long as the victim suffers. That's a just punishment. If you were violated when you were a child sexually, let me tell you something. A just punishment is that that person suffers for the rest of their life because you're going to suffer the rest of your life. That would be just. That would be equitable. Suffering to suffering. How about this? What's, what if the victim is eternal God? Oh, you say, well, God doesn't suffer. Really? Now, look, if you come to this church, one of the things you're going to find is that we believe the Bible is literal unless the Bible is clearly telling us that it's not literal. We interpret everything to be literal in the Bible unless the Bible clearly tells us that it's not literal. What does the Bible say about God's suffering? Well, first of all, after man fell into sin in Genesis 6, 6, the Bible says, and the Lord was sorry. Isn't that suffering? He was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Oh, if, if you're going to a church, if you're going to a church that tells you that God is transcendent and he doesn't experience suffering like we do, leave the church. I'm looking on line here because you're here this morning. If they tell you, well, that's not literal, leave the church. God suffers. The text says it. You say, well, is there more than one place? Well, yeah. How about Psalm 78, 40? How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. You see, you have the Genesis 6, 6 was at the beginning. And, and at the beginning, here was mankind, and what they were doing is they were killing whoever they wanted to kill. They were shedding innocent blood. And not only were they killing whoever they wanted to kill, they, they were not only shedding innocent blood, they were taking any woman they wanted to take, and they were raping them. And God looked at that and said, I'm sorry that I have made man. And it grieved him in his heart. And then what you have in Psalm 78 is a recounting of how the, the people of Israel came out of slavery in Egypt and God blessed them and delivered them. And they turned and they worshipped idols. And it provoked God in the wilderness, it says. And it grieved him, it says, in the desert. God was suffering. And then in Psalm 95, for 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my wrath. Does that sound like someone that's suffering? Isaiah 63.10 But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. That's about the nation of Israel before they went into the Babylonian exile. Psalm 711, 
God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Does that sound like someone who's suffering? So let me ask you a question. If God can suffer, which the text clearly says, how long will God suffer because of the sins of those he created? He says, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You see, the just penalty for any sin against God is eternal punishment that we suffer as long as he does. Unless, <laughs> unless someone somehow makes a payment for sin that would satisfy God's justice once and for all, unless someone does that, we all need to suffer for eternity because God is going to suffer for our sins for all of eternity. The devil would stand there and accuse him for all of eternity. And he would suffer because of his creation. Now, if somehow a payment for sin could be made, that payment for sin would have to be sufficient to satisfy God's justice. In other words, it would have to stop God from suffering for our sin. That, that payment would have to be a kind of payment that would cause God and man to suffer the consequences for sin once and for all. And isn't that what happened? Isaiah 53, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Jesus, as he is being crucified on the cross, and as he dies, God's suffering is satisfied. And so is man's because he was the God-man. Just like that. How wise is God? How incredible is God? Only God could think that up. This is what Jesus accomplished. As the God-man, when he died on the cross, his death satisfied God's justice. It stopped the suffering. In his death, God and man suffered for sin once and for all. God's justice is done, and Jesus said it is finished. You know what that means? Praise God. That means if you have received Jesus, God has stopped suffering for your sin. Because Jesus... Stopped it. He satisfied it. That sacrifice was so great, there's not another sacrifice like it. There's nothing you can do to make atonement for your sin. There's nothing you can do to stop God from suffering for your sin. But Jesus stopped it. You're released from punishment because the victim of your sin is no longer suffering from your sin. He remembers your sins no more because of what Jesus' accomplishment. He separates you from your sins as far as the east is the west because of what Jesus accomplished. He takes your sins and he buries them in the depths of the sea because of what Jesus accomplished. God is no longer suffering because of your sin. And you don't have to suffer either. Justice, personal justice, has been satisfied. What if you haven't received Jesus? What if you're not under the blood? What if you haven't bowed the knee to Jesus? Well, your sins are not covered. The Bible was very clear. Jesus was very clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God commanded his love toward us and that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. But what about those who are not rightly related to Jesus? Your sin is still causing God to suffer and your sin is going to cause God to suffer for eternity. 
Let me tell you something. God's not going to stop suffering when people are in hell because he's a God of love. And he's going to suffer for all of eternity for the people that are in hell. You say, how can he do that? Because he's God. He's God. He can be all things to everyone at the same time because he's God. Oh, man. When you realize that your, your sin is really truly covered and the revelation of Jesus Christ becomes real to you, you become like Joseph. You love God. And you want to follow him. None of this easy believism. Get my fire insurance today. Walk out of this building and just be what I always was. No. When you really, really know God through Jesus Christ, you want to be like Joseph. You, you want to be a just person. I don't want to be guilty of anything. I want to be innocent. Yeah, I, I, I want to be a patient man. I don't want to be reacting rashly when I hear bad reports about things. I don't want to make a false judgment. I want to be patient with people. I want, to, I, I, I want to be a wise man who bases my decisions on the word of God. And why is that? Because God has been revealed to me through Jesus Christ. And I want to follow him because I love him. He's satisfied. He stopped the suffering for me. And that's why when you've received Jesus, I mean, you can dance a jig. You don't have to suffer for your sin and he's not suffering for your sin. It's finished. It's done. If you have not received Jesus, your sins are not covered. If you die without receiving Jesus, you will suffer eternally for your sins because God will still be suffering eternally for your sins. For all of eternity, God will be sorry that he made you. For all of eternity. It doesn't have to be that way. All you have to do is by faith repent of your sin and receive Jesus. <sighs> Love God. Do what he says. I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. Do you know God through Jesus? You know, if you don't, here's what I want you to do. I want you... To in just a moment, when we start singing, I want you to come right down here to me. You know we have a baptistry right back there? That baptistry has warm water in it. And we're ready to baptize you today. Right? After this service, if you're willing to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. So I invite you to come. Repent of your sin, receive Jesus, and be baptized. And just come to me right here. During this prayer time... We're also going to be praying for some other things that are going on in our church family. One is, we had three of our widows this last week that were in the hospital. And that, that would have been Barbara Lowry who had surgery on her shoulder. She's out now, but she had surgery on her shoulder. And then Rosalie Stoops, who as far as I know is still in the hospital with the flu. And then Shirley Warner, who's in a rehab center right down here on Walker. And I'm going to have one of our elders come and just lead people in prayer for those three, three people. And so, Hugh, would you do that? Would you come up here on my right? And he's going to be praying for those three people. And then I'm going to ask uh, Nathan, if you'll come over here to my left. I'm going to ask Nathan to be leading this group in prayer for people that are going to be alone at Christmas. I asked one of our widows, what are you going to do for Christmas? And they said, I don't know. That broke my heart. They don't know what they're going to do. And you know, there's scores of people like that out there. So I want Nathan to just pray for those who are lonely, those that don't have a place to go at Christmas. Pray that God would work in their hearts and draw them to himself. And then I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask someone else here to come up. Uh, Steve, would you come up? And I want you to, there's so many people that are sick right now. I'm going to ask Steve to lead a group of people in just praying for people that are sick. Sondra was sick all last week. I've had so many people tell me they were sick. And so I'm going to ask you, and if you want to pray with these folks about that, I invite you to come. But if you want to receive Jesus, 
I invite you, I want you to come to me, okay? I want you to come right here, and I, and I will lead you to Jesus, and we will take you up there and baptize you. This is your invitation. Let's stand together. If you have any other reason 